Hello students, welcome to this session of environment and ecology. Today, we will discuss about previous year questions related to pollution. In the last session, we have already started with our discussion of previous year questions related to pollution. Now, we will resume our discussion of those questions. In that session, we have discussed previous year questions from 2011 to 2012. Now, 2013 to 2020 questions will be discussed with you. So, let us start with first question. So, question for 2013 now. Okay, first question is, which of the following can be found as pollutants in drinking water in some parts of India. So, the question is about pollutants present in drinking water and options are first arsenic, second sorbitol, third fluoride, fourth formaldehyde and fifth is uranium. Right? So, these are the these are the some chemicals that are given in questions and you have to find pollutants present in drinking water. So, we know that formaldehyde is not a pollutant which is present in drinking water. Rather, it can be considered as a pollutant in air, right? Because formaldehyde is used in various furniture parts as well as flooring and hence it is emitted as fumes and thus it is one of the pollutants especially in indoor air pollution and that's why formaldehyde should not be your choice because formaldehyde is not related to pollutants in drinking water. See it is a pollutant but the question is not about general pollutants it is about the water pollutants or pollutants present in drinking water, right? That is why fourth option or fourth statement you should remove. So, this is removed and this is removed and you are left with 1, 3 and 1, 3 and 5 mentioned in A and C respectively. That means for sure 1 and 3 that means arsenic and fluoride are the pollutants present in drinking waters in some parts of India, right? We generally hear about the presence of arsenic and fluoride, which leads to various waterborne, waterborne diseases. And that's why they are prime water pollutants present in some parts of India. Similarly, second statement, that means sorbitol. See, sorbitol is again not a pollutant. Rather, it is an outcome of photosynthesis process carried out in plants and sorbitol is a kind of storage and transport sugar used in plant materials and that's why you should also remove sorbitol fine so now you are left with 13 and 13 and 5 so the question is about uranium whether it is a pollutant present in water drinking water or not Uranium, we know that it is a radioactive material and its prime use is in nuclear power generation. So, generally the uranium which is uranium 235, it is used for the production of nuclear power, right? And these uranium or these isotopes of uranium are present in soil and hence there may be a leaching of these isotopes of uranium in drinking water and that is why uranium is also a pollutant present in drinking water in some parts of India, right? And that is why your answer is 1, 3 and 5 that means C, right? So, I hope it is clear to you. What we have done here? We have used the method of elimination where firstly, we were sure about that the formaldehyde is not a pollutant present in drinking water and that is why we eliminated 
statement number four from all the options wherever it is present. So it was present in option B and D and that's why we removed it and hence our choice now restricted to A and C. So there we were sure about means as it was given in the statement only. So one and three are the pollutants that means arsenic and fluoride are the pollutants for sure and hence we have to make choice with respect to uranium only. Fine. So these kind of methods you should use in your examinations and this method is called as elimination. Right. So please earlier also I have I have requested you to go through previous year questions and also try to solve few test series papers so that you can practice this method of elimination. Fine. So it was it, it is method of elimination which is very very useful in multiple choice questions. Right. So that was the first question from 2013. Next question now. So the answer you can see is C. So sorbitol is sugar transport and uh, storage sugar in most plant formations or families and formaldehyde is used in flooring furniture and fabric and hence it is a kind of air pollutant present inside the houses or commercial dwellings. Next question now. Question is due to improper or indiscriminate disposal of hold and used computers or their parts which of the following are released in the environment as e-waste. So the question is about the e-waste and they are asking e-waste consists of which of the contaminants given in the question. Fine. So out of these seven statements given in this question you are supposed to identify the constituents of e-waste. So e-waste is that waste which is generated as a result of electronic goods that we use and when these electronic goods are not usable now they are being dumped away and as a result of that that leads to the formation of e-waste right. So e-waste is that electronic waste which is not used now. That means they have outlived their utility and as a result of non-availability of handling procedures for electronic goods which have outlived their utility they are being dumped away in unscientific manner and that leads to the formation of e-waste and these days we are generating lots of electronic waste because we are using those electronic goods that we were not using earlier and every sphere of our life is influenced by electronic goods and hence it is the need of the hour to take care of environment from these e-waste because they consist of various kinds of contaminants right. So the statements are first beryllium, second cadmium, third chromium, fourth heptachlor, fifth mercury, sixth lead, seventh plutonium right. So out of these you have to identify what are the constituents of electronic waste. So let us discuss these statements. So first of all plutonium. So you must be aware of the fact that plutonium is a radioactive material and it is not a e-waste and hence you should remove statement number 7 from whatever options you can see. So whenever these, these many statements are given at that time your question becomes quite easy if you are aware of few of the statements. Right. So plutonium is not correct statement and hence you should remove plutonium and that's why you are left with option number B only which consists of beryllium, cadmium, chromium, mercury and lead. So these are the 
constituents beryllium cadmium chromium mercury and lead these are the constituents of electronic waste right so answer is b so it was quite easy for us to identify the the uh, pollutants which are present in electronic waste because we were I, we were able to remove one particular statement from options as we were quite sure about the fact that plutonium is a radioactive material and it is used for production of nuclear power right so that is about this question so we will discuss this question uh, based upon this discussion that is being given so what are electronic goods or oh, sorry electronic waste so electronic waste or e waste uh, are those products that are unwanted not working and nearing or at the end of their useful life so now those electronic goods are not useful or they are at the end of their useful life computers televisions vcrs stereos copywriters fax machines are copiers that means the xerox machine or uh, photocopy machines copiers and fax machines are everyday electronic products that are that may contribute to e waste certain components of some electronic products contain material that render e waste hazardous as they contain toxic materials including beryllium chromium cadmium mercury and lead which pose serious environmental risk to our soil water air and wildlife so next time upsc may ask question like e waste may be harmful to which of the abiotic components of the environment so e waste or the components of e waste are harmful to soil water air and wildlife as well fine so this is about this question so what are the other options that are being given so we have discussed about plutonium which is a radioactive metallic element which plays an important role in the generation of nuclear power and the other option was heptachlor so heptachlor is an organochlorine insecticide applied as a treatment for seed treatment in maize small grain sorghum or as direct to foliage so it can be ident it can be used as the uh, treatment for seed or it can directly be added to foliage right so heptachlor is not a part of electronic waste because it is a kind of insecticide applied to seeds or foliage directly right so i hope this is clear to you now and that's why answer is b as we have already discussed next now so see you can see this question again on the on the face of it or prima facie we may find this question very difficult because there are many statements that are being given in this question but rather than means in, instead of many statements given in this question it becomes quite easy to eliminate those statements if we are aware of one or two statements of that question surely if we are aware of them we can use those statements to find out right answer fine so that is the elimination method and it is more useful for those questions where we may have number of statements now next question acid rain acid rain is caused by pollution of environment by which of the following so acid rain we we know that see natural rain is acidic in nature but acid rain is that rain whose ph value is around 4 right so you must be aware of the fact that ph level is from 0 to 14 this is ph scale this is ph scale and those those elements whose ph value is more than 7 they are 
basic or alkaline and those elements whose pH value is less than 7 they are acidic in nature right and natural rain natural rain is a is a weak acid it is a weak acid that means that means its pH is close to 7 it is around 6.7 to 7 pH and that's why it is considered as a weak acid but acid rain acid rain is that form of natural rain whose pH is close to 4, whose pH value is close to 4 and this acid rain is the result of certain pollutants present in air and those pollutants are nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide. We know that sulfur dioxide may be released from natural sources like volcanic eruptions and also it may be emitted from use of fossil fuels. Similarly, nitrous oxide is also emitted as a, as a pollutant from activities like agriculture or it may also be emitted through sewage wastewater. And whenever these pollutants are released in air, they rise up they may have the tendency to react with moisture present in air so that they are converted into nitric acid nitric acid or sulfuric acid hno3 nitric acid or H2SO4, H2SO4, fine. So these pollutants whenever emitted in air, they have the tendency to react with the moisture present in air and that is why they are converted into acidic uh, forms like nitric acid HNO3 and sulfuric acid H2SO4 and these acids may come down on the earth's surface through rainwater and that is nothing but acid rain right that is nothing but acid rain so what causes acid rain acid rain is caused by pollutants like nitrous oxides and sulfur dioxide right so that is about this question next Fine. So, acid rain results when sulfur dioxide and nitrogen ox oxides are emitted into atmosphere and transported by wind and air currents. So, they are transported to the upper layers of the atmosphere. The SO2 and NOx react with water, oxygen and other chemicals to form sulfuric and nitric acids. These then mix with water and other materials before falling on the ground and that's why answer to this question is d nitrous oxides and or nitric nitric nitrogen oxides and sulfur dioxide fine so i hope it is clear to you next question now so we are done with 2013's question now 2014's question which of the following are some important pollutants released by steel industry in India right so what are the pollutants that are released by steel industry that is the question so we know that see steel industry uses fossil fuel because we have to ensure that the steel is produced from iron ore and during this production of steel whether uh, various other constituents or compounds are used and they are in the form of coke etc right so coke is one of the important constituent 
during the production of steel. And as a result of use of coke, various pollutants are released. So coke production is one of the major pollution sources from steel production. Air emissions such as coke oven gas, naphthalene, ammonium compounds, crude light oil, sulfur and coke dust are released from coke oven. So whenever coke is produced in steel plants, these pollutants are emitted. Next. In steel furnace, so apart from these pollutants that are emitted as a result of coke production, there are certain other gases that are also released. So in steel furnace, coke reacts with iron ore, releasing iron and generating carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide gases. Due to the use of coal, pollutants such as sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides are also released, right? So in steel production, when we use certain fossil fuels like coal, we are emitting oxides of sulfur and oxides of nitrogen as well, apart from carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And that's why answer of this question is is all of the above. So all these pollutants are emitted from steel industry in India. Right? Next now. Next question is, there is some concern regarding the nanoparticles of some chemical elements. So here, what they have done, they have use the linkage of science and technology and environment because nanotechnology is one of the important technologies that is being used in various sectors primarily in medical sector because nanoparticles given their size I hope you must be aware of the fact that nanoparticles are of the size of 10 raised to minus 9 meters and as a result of this small size of nanoparticles, nanoparticles can be used in targeted drug delivery in medical sector. And that's why it is one of the potential techniques to treat cancer in future. Because with targeted drug delivery of cancer treatment, we can ensure that the side effects of drugs can be reduced. And hence, it is a potential technology that can be used for medical treatment. So this question is about nanoparticles of, uh, means there are some nanoparticles which are of concern that are used by industry in the manufacturing of various products. And we are being asked why they are a concern. So the options are, sorry, statements are first, they can accumulate in the environment and contaminate water and soil. Second statement, they can enter the food chains. And third statement, they can trigger the production of free radicals. Right? So, the nanoparticles are of size 10 raised to minus 9 meters. And as a result of this small size, of nanoparticles and as we have started using nanoparticles in various sectors there are concerns related to nano waste and as a result of this nano waste there is a concern that they may accumulate in the environment leading to pollution of water and soil and that's why first statement is a correct statement Right? So, first statement of this question is correct. So, a nanoparticle is of 10 raised to minus 9 meter size. Nanoparticles exist in the natural world and are also created as a result of human activities. So, during our discussion of nanotechnology, we will find out that 
there are various natural ways based upon which nanoparticles will be created and there are also human induced processes based upon which we can again generate nanoparticles. So we will discuss that during our discussion of nanotechnology. Next. So statement one is correct as we have already discussed because as a result of use of nanoparticles, nano waste may be generated. Second statement, the nanoparticles can be ingested by aquatic organisms and as a result of that, they may enter in the food chain, right? So the nanoparticles may enter in the food chain and that's why even second statement is correct with respect to this question. Third statement is, so experimental studies have shown that nanoparticles can trigger the production of free radicals in our bodies and that's why even third statement is correct statement. See this technology, nanotechnology is technology in development. That's mean, that means it is not a final knowledge about nanotechnology that we have right now. This is evolving technology and hence our knowledge will be upgraded as and when new research are done and new information is being generated about nanoparticles and that's why answer to this question is D. All the three statements that means nano waste which, which may contaminate soil and water, nanoparticles entering into food chain and nanoparticles leading to production of certain free radicals are correct. And that's right, answer is D, all of the above. Next now, next question is, brominated flame retardants, brominated flame retardants are used in many household products like mattresses and upholstery. Why is there some concern about their use? Statements are, first, they are highly resistant to degradation in the environment. Second statement, they are able to accumulate in humans and animals. And you have to find out the correct statements about these brominated flame retardants. So brominated flame retardants are those products which are used in the production of various products that we are using in our daily life, right from mattresses, upholstery, that means the furniture products. And as a result of these brominated flame retardants, these products become retardant to or they become resistant to fire. And hence, they catch fire after a long time. They are not easily or they, they do not catch fire very easily, right? And that is why these brominated flame retardants are used in the production of these products that we use in our daily life. But brominated flame retardants are bioaccumulants. That means they may accumulate in the environment and also in the bodies of plants and animals. And that's why both these statements are correct statements. So they are bioaccumulants and they are also highly resistant to the degradation. And that's why both these statements are correct. And hence answer is C, both one and two. So we'll discuss about these brominated flame retardants. So they are the mixture of man-made chemicals that are added to wide variety of products to make them less flammable. So that is the use of brominated flame retardants based upon which we can make products less retardant or less inflammable. Flame retardants are often added to following uh, compounds or following products, furnishing such as foam, upholstery, mattresses, etc electronic goods such as computers, laptop, phones, television, household appliances, etc. Fine. Moreover, they are also used in building and construction material including electrical wires and cables and also in the transportation products such as seats, seat covers 
and fillings, bumpers, overhead compartments and other parts of the vehicles. And that's why they are quite popular in various industries. But there is flip side to these brominated flame retardants. That is, they do not easily break down and they are bioaccumulants or they build up in the bodies of people and animals. And that's why both these statements are correct and hence answer is C. Right? So I hope it is clear to you. Brominated flame retardants. Next question is, now we will be discussing about 2015's question. First question, in the cities of our country, which among the following atmospheric gases are normally considered in calculating the value of air quality index? So you must be aware of the fact that as a part of Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, the government has started calculating the concentration of various pollutants in airs of various cities, in air of various cities. And that is being done through National Air Quality Index. And while calculating this National Air Quality Index, there are certain pollutants that are being considered by the, by the government. Right? And you have been asked in this question, which are those pollutants that are considered while calculating air quality index for a particular city. So one of the major points that you should remember about national air quality index is that there are total eight pollutants that are being tracked by the government in order to calculate air quality index. But carbon dioxide is not that pollutant which is being used for the calculation of air quality index. And hence, you should remove carbon dioxide. And that's why when you remove this carbon dioxide, you will have to remove statement or options A, C and D. And you are left with 2, 3, 4. That means carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. Right. So these are the three pollutants which are being tracked during the calculation of national air quality index and apart from these three there are other pollutants that are also tracked by the government and they are first particulate matter 10 and particulate matter 2.5 ozone ozone at the ground level then ammonia and lead right so pm 10 pm 2.5 lead Ammonia and ozone are the other pollutants that are being tracked apart from carbon monoxide, oxides of nitrogen and sulfur dioxide. Right? So that is about this question and hence answer of this question is B. And based upon this or based upon these pollutants present in air, air is categorized into six different types and those categories are good, satisfactory, moderate, poor, very poor and severe. Fine. And most of the most of the cities in India have poor air quality and sometimes or especially cities like Delhi, they have a very poor and severe category of air quality. So that is about national air quality index. Next question is what can be the impact of excessive inappropriate use of nitrogenous fertilizers in agriculture? Right. So the question is about the improper or excessive use of nitrogenous fertilizers in agriculture. Statements are first proliferation of nitrogen fixing microorganisms in soil can occur. Second. Increase in the acidity of soil can take place. Third statement, leaching of nitrate to the groundwater can occur. Fine, and you have to find out the correct statements from the above mentioned three statements. So the first statement is about the proliferation of nitrogen fixing bacteria if we add 
more nitrogenous fertilizers to soil. So this statement is not correct because nitrogenous fertilizers when added to soil they do not lead to increase in the population of nitrogen fixing bact bacteria because nitrogen fixing bacteria do not use nitrogen as a source of their energy or food. Fine. And that's why first statement is quite vague statement. And that's why you should eliminate this particular statement. So when you eliminate first statement, you have to eliminate option A and D. And that's why you are left with two and three only. Fine. So you are left with two only and two on two and three only. That means two is correct for sure. Whenever you add nitrogenous fertilizers to or excessive nitrogenous fertilizers to soil, it increases acidity of soil, right? So second statement is, is correct for sure. Third statement is about leaching of nitrates into the groundwater. See this, this happens as a result of excessive addition of certain compounds and in this case nitrogenous compounds along with along with excessive flooding or excessive rain in that region. When there, is, there are water locked conditions in that region, water percolates down and as water percolates down, it also leaches away or removes the compounds that are present in excess. In this case, they are nitrogenous fertilizers and hence leaching of nitrate is one of the results if we use these fertilizers in excess and that's why answer is C, 2 and 3 only, fine. So first we have removed because as a result of excessive addition of nitrogenous fertilizers, microorganisms which are fixing the nitrogen which may be in the form of rhizobium or azotobacter their proliferation do not occur because they are not using nitrogen as their source of energy and hence first statement was incorrect and second statement and third statement are correct statements fine so first statement is incorrect second is correct and third statement is also correct and hence answer is c right so i hope it is clear to you now next statement oh sorry next question With reference to fly ash, so fly ash is a, is a byproduct of burning up of coal, especially in thermal power plants. So the, with reference to fly ash produced by power plants using coal as fuel, which of the following statements is are correct? So you have to identify which of the statements are correct with respect to fly ash and as we have already discussed fly ash is a byproduct of thermal power plants which use coal as a source of fuel and this fly ash is considered as a particulate matter and it consists of oxides of silica aluminium calcium magnesium sodium etc and there are certain compounds which are considered as pollutants in fly ash and hence fly ash need to be addressed properly if we want to ensure that the fly ash do not lead to contamination of various abiotic components of the environment. So the statements are first fly ash can be used in the production of bricks for building construction activities. So this statement is correct statement because the buildings or uh, the bricks that are being used or that are being produced, they use fly ash as one of the constituents and hence first statement is correct statement. Second statement, fly ash can be used as a replacement for some of the Portland cement contents of concrete. So as fly ash uh, can be used for the production of bricks. It may also be used as a replacement for 
some of the products or some of the constituents for the production of Portland cement. And that's why even second statement is also a correct statement. Fine. So, ply ash as it can be used for the production of bricks and other Portland cement constituents or they can replace Portland cement constituents. First two statements are correct statements. Next, third statement is fly ash is made up of silicon dioxide calcium oxide only and does not contain any toxic element. So, this is a extreme statement because as we have discussed fly ash consists of oxides of aluminium, silica, calcium, sodium, magnesium along with certain toxic materials and that is why third statement is incorrect statement and also as we have already discussed whenever there are certain extreme words that are used in a particular statement you should become alert right so only is an extreme statement extreme word used in this statement so you should become alert and you should read that question or statement once more fine so based upon this third statement is incorrect and that's why answer is a 1 and 2 only right so the fly ash composed of primarily silicon dioxide and calcium oxide also it consists potentially toxic elements including arsenic chromium lead and mercury and that's why third statement is incorrect statement and answer is A, 1 and 2 only. Fine. So, I hope it is clear to you now. Next question. Now, we will be moving to the 2017 or uh, po uh, questions related to pollution from 2017. Right. So, just a minute. So, let us discuss uh, first question from 2017. In the context of solving pollution problems, what is or are the advantage advantages of bioremediation technique? So, bioremediation is one of the techniques which is used to address the biodegradable waste. Because as name suggests, bioremediation, so it uses certain kind of microorganisms which can feed upon organic waste as a result of which that organic waste can be converted into manure by these microorganisms. And hence bioremediation is one of the scientific and best method or environment friendly method to address the problem of solid waste management. But one of the concerns, not concerns exactly, but one of the disadvantage of this bioremediation is that it can only address the problem of biodegradable waste, not non-biodegradable waste. So, let us discuss or let us uh, discuss the questions or statements related to this question. First statement is, it is a technique for cleaning up pollution by enhancing the same biodegradation pro process that occurs in nature. Second statement, any contaminant with heavy metals such as cadmium and lead can, can be readily and completely can be readily and completely treated by bioremediation using microorganisms. Third, genetic engineering can be used to create microorganisms specially designed for bioremediation. Fine. So, these are the three statements and you have to find out correct statements out of these three statements. Right. So, let us discuss bioremediation. So, as we have already discussed, it is one of the environment friendly method based upon which we can use microorganisms which can convert biodegradable waste into manure. And as it is a natural process, we are using this natural phenomenon at a large scale to ensure 
biodegradable waste problem is addressed and hence first statement is correct statement with respect to this question. Second statement is about the use of bio remediation, remediation for contaminants like cadmium and lead and this statement says that which bio remediation will be able to address the problem of heavy metals like cadmium and lead completely and readily but that is not the case because bio remediation cannot be used for those contaminants which are non biodegradable and hence second statement is incorrect statement third statement is about use of genetic engineering to produce certain kind of microorganisms which can help us in bio remediation we know that genetic engineering is the advanced form or advanced method in biotechnology based upon which we can manipulate the genes of various microorganisms and organisms as a result of genetic engineering we can put certain characteristics in different microorganisms which can help us to produce those microorganisms which are useful in bio remediation that means suppose we have certain natural microorganisms and those microorganisms are good with respect to decomposition of biodegradable material now we can extract those genes of those microorganisms and those genes can be introduced in other microorganisms as well so that those other microorganisms can also become useful for biodegradation and that's why with genetic engineering we can create such microorganisms which can be used for the treatment of or which can be used in the in the process of bio remediation right so third statement is correct statement and that's why answer of this question is 1 and 3 only mentioned in option c so you can go through this particular discussion or explanation based upon which we have eliminated second statement right so answer of this question is c next now so next question is is it possible to produce algae based biofuel but what is are the likely limitations of developing countries in promoting this industry so the question is about use of certain algae for the production of biofuels biofuels are those fuels which are generated out of plant based materials primarily right so for example traditionally we are using jatropha for the production of biofuels but with national biofuel policy given by the government in 2018 certain other plant based or even crops can be used for the production of biofuels for example rotten potatoes broken grains sugar beet etc can be used for the production of biofuels right so this question is about biofuels and its production using algae so statements are first production of algae based biofuel is possible in seas only and not on continents second statement setting up and engineering the algae based biofuel production requires high level of expertise technology until the construction is complete and third statement economically viable production necessitates the setting up of large scale facilities which may raise ecological and social concerns so you have to find out correct statements from these three statements so let us discuss this question so firstly biofuels are fuels derived from biomass and this biomass may be plant or algae material 
or animal waste. Since such feedstock material can be replenished readily, biofuel is considered as a source of or as a renewable source of energy because biofuels are produced from biomass and biomass is related to animals, plants and algae and this biomass can be replenished quickly and hence it is considered as a renewable source of energy. Next, biofuel is commonly advocated as cost effective and environmentally environment friendly alternative to the sources of energy that we are using right now. So let us discuss the statements that are mentioned in this question. First statement is though primarily algae grow in water. So first statement talks about the growth of algae only in sea and not on continents. So first statement though primarily algae grow in water it can also grow on land. And that's why first statement is incorrect statement because first statement talks about the limitation of developing country because algae can grow only in water, not in sea, oh, sorry, not in continent, not on continent. And hence third state, first statement is incorrect statement. Second, the production of plant for biofuel from algae require the specialized knowledge for establishing right procedures. Hence, till the construction of plant, there will be a need of expertise. And that's why second statement is correct statement because as it is a new technology, as we are using algae for the production of biofuels, we will need expert knowledge at least till the construction of these biofuel plants. And hence, second statement is a correct statement with respect to this question. Third statement, in order to make algae based biofuel economically viable, economics of scale are important. For this purpose, commercial growth of algae may be needed. But such growth of algae on large scale may create problems in terms of land for the production of food grains. So if we want to use algae for the production of biofuels, then for a country like India or for other developing countries which may have high population, they will need to use algae or they will have to produce algae at commercial level so that it can be used for the production of biofuels. But that may lead to lack of availability of land for food grains production. And that is one of the problems. Also, commercial growth of algae may act as invasive species for an area which it has been in which it has been grown. And that's why there are certain ecological concerns as well. And hence, third statement is also correct because it talks about those concerns. And that's why only first statement and third statement are correct. Sorry, only second and third statement are correct and hence answer of this question is B, 2 and 3 only, right? So only second and third statement are correct. First statement is not correct because algae can be grown on land as well as on sea. So answer is B. Next question now. 2018's question. So first question from 2018, which of the following is are the possible consequence consequences of heavy sand mining in uh, river beds? So the question is about sand mining and that too heavy sand mining in uh, river beds. So the consequence, the statements are first decreased salinity in the river. Second, pollution of groundwater. Third, lowering of the water table. And you have to select correct statements from these options. So, sand mining is the activity based upon which the sand is extracted from open pit 
and sometimes from beaches and inland dunes or dreaded from oceans or river beds as well fine so dredging activity is also used for extraction of sand from oceans and river beds so what are these statements so what are the impacts of sand mining first sand mining transform the river bed into large and deep pit so river bed as a result of excessive sand mining may be transformed into deep and large pit as a result of this groundwater table drops leaving the drinking water wells on embankment of these rivers dry so what may happen suppose consider that consider that this is a river bed right so this is a river and in order to extract sand sand miners have made a dig here or it they have made a pit here what will happen as a result of this as a result of this pit water from river will accumulate in this pit and it will not percolate in the groundwater or it may not percolate downwards to replen or replenish the groundwater and hence one of the impact of sand mining is less availability of water to replenish groundwater sources and that's why the statement number 3 is correct so lowering of groundwater tables is one of the impacts of excessive sand mining in river beds and that's why you will need you can eliminate this particular statement or this particular choice from this question so a you should eliminate next now next impact sand mining activities will have an impact upon river's water quality it in uh, the impact includes increased turbidity of water so whenever sand mining is is carried out it disturbs the settled particles at the ground of river bed and as a result of this those unsettled particles will increase the turbidity of water and that is nothing but increase in the pollution in ground water or increased in the pollution in the water of river as well and that's why this is also one of the impacts of river bed sand mining and hence even second statement is correct statement so second statement and third statements are correct with respect to impact of excessive sand mining first statement is about decrease in salinity of river water see sand mining do not have any relation with the salinity of river water because salinity is a property based upon the dissolution of salts in river water right so it does not have any relation with the mining of sand from river and hence this is not the impact of excessive sand mining and that's why answer is 2 and 3 only so answer is 2 and 3 that means option b next question now consider the following statement so now we will be discussing about 2019's questions first question consider the following statements first agricultural soils release nitrogen oxides into environment second statement cattle release ammonia into environment third statement poultry industry release reactive nitrogen compounds into environment you have to select correct statements from these three statements so let us discuss these three statements one by one just a minute <coughs> starting with first so agricultural soils release nitrogen oxides in environment so we know that 
agricultural soils are added with various nitrogenous compounds and also there are certain natural processes based upon which the agricultural soil may have presence of nitrogenous compounds and these compounds may be released back into the atmosphere as activity of various microorganisms again and that's why agricultural soils have the tendency to release nitrogen oxides into the environment and hence first statement is correct statement second statement is about release of ammonia from cattle so cattle they or their urine have the presence of urea which is a nitrogenous compound whenever there is reaction between the cow dung or the dung of any cattle waste material of any cattle with urine which consist of urea it leads to production of ammonia and that's why even second statement is correct statement right next poultry poultry industry releases reactive nitrogen compounds into environment see again as a part of natural process nitrogenous compounds are released or reactive nitrogenous compounds are released from poultry because they are the uh, hens or chicks that are being reared in poultry industry are living beings and hence third statement is also correct and that's why answer is all of the above mentioned in option d so we'll read this question uh, this statement or this explanation agricultural soils contribute to over 70% of nitrogen dioxide emissions from india in 2010 followed by wastewater so it is agricultural soil which which emits most of the nitrogen oxides from india right or in india followed by wastewater which emits 12% and residential and commercial activities which emits 6% of nitrogenous oxides next statement nitrogen is the uh, is present in the diet and is it is not broken efficiently by cattle fine so whenever cattle feed on any any uh, fodder they are not able to break this nitrogen present in that fodder as a result of that it is excreted in the form of urea mostly through urine when urine and fecus mix the urea is rapidly converted into ammonia which is then released into the environment or atmosphere fine so ammonia is released as a result of the activities of cattle and hence even second statement is correct with respect to this question third statement is about uh, poultry industry and they are emitting a reactive nitrogen so poultry industry with an annual growth of 6% recorded an excretion of reactive nitrogen compounds by of 0.415 tons in 2016 which is anticipated to increase to 1.089 tons by 2030 so poultry industry is one of the source of reactive nitrogen compound and hence even third statement is correct answer is d all of the above right next now in the context of which one of the following are the terms pyrolysis and plasma gasification mentioned so uh, we know that in india solid waste management is a problem and that's why supreme court the supreme court of india has rightly mentioned that the solid waste management is a time bomb ticking over indian cities and that's why we have to find out various environment friendly methods based upon which we can address the problem of solid waste management and bioremediation 
pyrolysis and plasma gasification can be those methods based upon which we can address this problem and hence plasma gasification and pyrolysis are the methods based upon which we can convert waste to energy right so let us discuss these methods firstly we'll discuss about pyrolysis so pyrolysis is the method of heating organic materials such as biomass in the absence of oxygen in the absence of oxygen the biomass is heated because no oxygen is present the material does not combust but the chemical compounds mostly cellulose kind of compounds in the biomass that make the material thermally decompose into combustible gases and charcoal so whenever we try to burn biomass in the absence of oxygen the certain compounds present in those biomass are converted into or they are thermally decomposed into combustible gases and charcoal these gases mostly uh, most of these combustible gases can be condensed into combustible liquid called as pyrolysis oil or bio oil fine so whatever gases that are produced as a result of pyrolysis they can be converted into fluid and that fluid is combustible fluid and that is called as pyrolysis oil or bio oil and hence ultimately as a result of pyrolysis there are three compounds that are produced first is bio oil as we have discussed second is bio char and third is syngas so all these states that means solid state in the form of biochar liquid state in the form of bio oil or pyrolysis oil and gaseous state in the form of syngas are produced during pyrolysis and as this as these are the form of energy pyrolysis is one of the ways based upon which waste can be converted into energy right next now let us discuss about plasma gasification so plasma gasification is an extreme thermal process using plasma which converts organic matter into a syngas right so organic matter can be converted into syngas again with the help of plasma gasification which is syngas is primarily made up of hydrogen and carbon monoxide so as syngas is primarily made of hydrogen we know that hydrogen is one of the source of energy and that's why even using plasma gasification we can produce or we can convert waste into energy and that's why both these pyrolysis and plasma gasification are the methods based upon which we can convert waste into energy and hence answer of this question is d next now consider the following first carbon monoxide second methane third ozone and fourth sulfur dioxide which of the above are released into atmosphere due to the burning up of crop or biomass residue that means see this question was from 2019 and we know that stubble burning is one of the problems that is being faced especially by ncr region right and as a result of stubble burning carried out in punjab haryana and western up the national capital region is is getting polluted every winter so the question was asked from this particular topic because the stubble the paddy stubble that is being burned during october november period is a kind of biomass so what kind of gases are released as a result of burning up of biomass or crops residue that is the question so uh, let us discuss this question and as a result of burning up of biomass all these gases are released so burning up of these residues emit gases like sulfur dioxide 
ऑक्साइड्स ऑफ नाइट्रोजन कार्बन डाइऑक्साइड कार्बन मोनोऑक्साइड ब्लैक कार्बन ऑर्गेनिक कार्बन मीथेन वोलाटाइल ऑर्गेनिक कंपाउंड्स नॉन मीथेन हाइड्रोकार्बन ओजोन एंड एरोजोल्स एक्सेट्रा सो दी क्वेश्चन हैज गिवन मीथेन ओजोन कार्बन मोनोक्साइड जस्ट मिनट कार्बन मोनोक्साइड एंड सल्फर डाइऑक्साइड सो ऑल दीज गैसेस आर एमिटेड वेन एवर वी बर्न एनी क्रॉप रेसिड्यू और बायोमास एंड दीज आर दी गैसेस इवन रिलीज एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ फॉरेस्ट फायर्स और वाइल्ड फायर्स बिकॉज इन फॉरेस्ट फायर्स वॉट इज बींग बर्न इट इज द बायोमास राइट सो आंसर ऑफ दिस क्वेश्चन इज डी ऑल ऑफ द अब next now so question is why is there a great concern about the microbeads about the microbeads that are released into environment so the question is related to microbeads and as per un ep united nations environment program microbeads are those pollutants whose size is less than 5 mm and as a result of this small size of these microbeads they are not filtered out of filters that are generally used and hence they may enter into marine environment and as these and these microbeads can remain suspended in water it is mistaken by the aquatic organisms as a food and that's why these microbeads are used as or they are entering into body of various aquatic organisms and subsequently it may enter into the body of human beings as well and that is one of the concerns associated with microbeads and recently you must be aware of the report given by one of the ngos in india and they have highlighted that presence of microbeads is one of the one of the concerns related to gangetic region especially haridwar and varanasi where these microbeads have been found by that ngo in large amount what must be the sources of these microbeads see microbeads are released into environment from two sources first is microbeads are used as one of the raw material for various cosmetic products it may be face wash so you must have felt very small tiny kind of thing in your face wash and that is nothing but a microbead fine so microbeads are entering into aquatic environment directly through these cosmetic products and at the same time microbeads may be produced which are called as microplastic from certain plastic material and their associated degradation right so there are two sources based upon which microbeads are entering into water body first is directly through cosmetic products and second through degradation of plastic that we use generally right so the microbeads are harmful because they are harmful to the marine ecosystem and that's why answer is a fine so they are of the size smaller than 5 mm and they are intentionally added in primary sources such as personal care product that means cosmetic products and clothing products or secondary sources that are formed by fragmentation of plastic over a period of time fine so whenever plastic normal plastic that we use as a result of degradation of that plastic see it is not biodegradable but due to wear and tear it may be broken into smaller size it is not biodegradable for sure but it is broken to smaller sizes as a result of wear and tear which leads to production of microplastic 
called as microbeads and hence answer is A. Next question now. In India, the use of carbofuran, methyl parathion, forate and triazophos is viewed with apprehension. These are the chemicals used as. So, primarily these are the extremely harmful pesticides that are used in India. And most of the states have banned their use. So, what are these chemicals? These are the pesticides used in agriculture sector. Fine. So, the answer for this question is A. Next question now. So, answer is A. Next question. Now we'll be discussing about 2020's question. So you can you can see the trend. These days, that means since 2018, the number of questions that are being asked from pollution has increased. So for 2019, almost four questions. For 2020, there are four to five questions asked from this particular topic of pollution. Fine. So let us discuss this topic. So, 2020's question now and this question is related to benzene pollution. Which of the following are reasons factors for exposure to benzene pollution? Statements are first, automobile exhaust, second, tobacco smoke, third, wood burning, fourth, using varnished wooden furniture, Fifth, using products made up of polyurethrin. But so, from or out of these, these statements given to you, you have to identify what leads to exposure or release of benzene. Right? So, uh, you have to select correct statements from this. Let us discuss this question. So, benzene is a chemical that is colorless and light yellow liquid and its smell is sweet odor and it is highly flammable liquid. Fine. So, benzene is a colorless kind of yellow liquid with sweet odor but highly flammable liquid. Benzene evaporates into air very quickly. Its vapor is heavier than air and may sink into low lying areas. So, whenever it is exposed to air, it may be converted into vapor. And as it is, as the vapor of benzene is heavier than air, it will sink to the low lying areas in, in regions where it has been emitted. Benzene dissolves only slightly in water and will float on top of water. Fine. So, the benzene have very weak dissolvable, dissolving property with respect to water. Benzene is formed from both natural and human induced processes. So, the sources of benzene are both natural as well as human induced. So, natural sources of benzene include volcanoes and forest fires. So, forest fires not only leads to emission of methane, carbon monoxide, oxides of sulfur, nitrogen, but along with that, it also leads to emission of benzene. Benzene is also a natural part of crude oil, gasoline and cigarette smoke. Some industries use benzene to make chemicals that are used to make plastics, resins, nylon, synthetic fibers, etc. Fine. And uh, outdoor air contains low levels of benzene from tobacco smoke, gas stations, motor vehicle exhaust and industrial emissions. So, apart from those natural sources, the activities like tobacco smoke, 
gas station release, motor vehicle exhaust and industrial emissions lead to addition of benzene in the outdoor environment. Indoor air generally contains levels of benzene higher than outdoor air. The benzene in indoor air comes from products that contain benzene such as glues, paints, furniture wax and detergents. The air around hazardous waste sites or gas stations can contain higher levels of benzene and that's why the statements given in this question, all those statements are correct statements with respect to emission of benzene. So automobile exhaust, yes. Tobacco smoke, wood burning, that means forest fire, you can consider forest fire. Use, using varnish wooden furniture, we have seen that paints, varnishes, they contain benzene. Using products made from polyutherine also leads to pollution with respect to benzene. And that's why all these are the statements which are true with respect to benzene pollution and hence answer is 1, 2, 3 and 5, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 mentioned in D, right? So that is about first question from 2020. Next, see official key for this, this year is not available, official key for 2020 is not available as of now because process is not completed for 2020. So official key is not allowed. Uh, not available. Next question now from 2020 itself. Steel slag can be the material for which of the following? Steel slag can be the material for which of the following? First, construction of base road. Second, improvement of agricultural land. And third, production of cement. You have to select correct statement for the use of steel slag. So steel slag as name suggests is a byproduct of steel making activity and it is produced during separation of molten steel from impurities. The slag occurs as molten liquid melt and it is a complex solution of silicates and oxides or oxides that solidifies upon cooling. So primarily the steel slag consists of silicates. Next, the use of steel slag as an aggregate is considered a standard practice in many jurisdictions. So it can be used as an aggregate for, for granular base in the production of or in the uh, construction of roads. Next, embankments, engineered fill, highway shoulders and hot mix asphalt pavements. And that's why it can be used in all the activities mentioned in this question as a base for construction of road, as, as a uh, material for the development of or for the improvement of agricultural land and finally production of cement. Right, so all these are the uses of steel slag and hence answer is D, all of the above. Next question. In rural road construction, just a minute. In rural road construction, the use of which of the following is preferred for ensuring environmental sustainability or to reduce carbon footprint. So what material should be used in rural road construction so that we can ensure environmental sustainability and we can reduce carbon footprint in rural areas. So those materials should have green properties. That means those materials should not be producing lots of emissions in the form of carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases. Similarly, they are produced or they should be produced with the use of renewable sources of energy. And that's why 
we will have to find out only those material which are considered as or which have the procedures which are environmentally friendly. So the uh, statements are first copper slag, second cold mix asphalt technology, third geotextile, fourth hot mix asphalt technology and fifth Portland cement. So here what we will do, we will use the elimination method because what we are supposed to find out, we have to find out those products that can reduce emissions as well as carbon footprint in rural areas. When we consider hot mix alpha uh, asphalt technology, in hot mix asphalt technology, this asphalt that is used for road construction is, is a liquid and that liquid binds together sand or other raw material that is used for road embankments or road constructions, right. So, whenever we use hot mix method for asphalt production, we are burning lots of fossil fuel and it may be in the form of wood and that is why this should not be the environmentally friendly technique for rural road construction because it leads to it leads to production of lots of pollution as well as it also generates greenhouse gases and hence this should be eliminated from these options that are being given so eliminate fourth statement from your answer so you should eliminate this one and this one right so now you are left with a and d first is correct because it is there in all the or it is there in both these options now whenever we or whenever we want to make sure that the road construction is environmentally friendly we will use such material which will have natural origin and geotextiles have natural origin. For example, jute, as a result of jute or coir, they can be used or jute or coir is, is a geotextile. That means they are produced with natural activities and they are allowed to be used in road construction activities and hence geotextile should be there in your answer and that's why third statement should be there and hence answer is 1, 2 and 3, right. Why not Portland cement? Because we know that whenever Portland cement is being manufactured, it leads to generation of lots of particulate matter. Moreover, for the manufacturing of Portland cement, we are using fossil fuels. And that's why this should not be used for environment friendly road construction in rural areas. Similarly, cold mix asphalt technology. With this particular technology, we are producing asphalt based upon cold or based upon those methods which do not need burning up of fossil fuels. And hence, it is also an environmentally friendly method. First is copper slag. See, it is a result of activities of extraction of pure copper. And whenever copper slag is produced, copper slag, slag as a byproduct of copper industry, copper manufacturing or copper extracting industry, it is considered as environmentally friendly byproduct. And hence, all these can be used for production of or construction of roads in rural areas for greener or environment, environmental sustainability as well as low carbon footprint in rural areas. Fine. And hence answer is 1, 2 and 3 mentioned in option A. Next now. So uh, you can go through this particular discussion at or this particular explanation at your home. Next question, consider the following statements. First, coal ash 
contains arsenic, lead and mercury. Second statement, coal fired power, sorry, coal fired power plants release sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen into the environment. And third statement is, high ash content is observed in Indian coal, right? So, you have to find out correct statements from these three statements mentioned in the question. And the question is about coal ash and see, we have discussed about coal ash earlier also, which is nothing but fly ash, which is nothing but fly ash, right? Because fly ash is produced as a result of burning up of coal in thermal power plants which use coal as a raw material. And let me take you back few slides back so that you can understand the importance of previous year questions. If you analyze previous year questions properly, they will always help you to channelize your study and sometimes they will, uh, they will help you in exams because they, there will be certain questions which will be directly inspired from previous year questions. So let me give you an evidence for that. So this question is about coal ash, which is also called as fly ash. So now I'll be taking you back to those slides where we have discussed about fly ash. And then you will understand that yes, previous year questions can help directly as well. So let me take you back to those slides. Yes, this particular, this particular question asked in 2015. So the question is about fly ash and during our discussion, we have discussed that during our discussion, we have discussed that fly ash consists of silicon dioxide and calcium oxide and at the same time it consists of toxic elements like arsenic, chromium, lead and mercury, right? So this was our discussion for 2015's question. Now let us check the statement for 2020's question. So what this statement mentions? Fly ash consists of certain toxic elements like arsenic, chromium, lead and mercury. So let us go back to uh, the 2020 question. Yes. So now read first statement. Coal ash contains arsenic, lead and mercury. So this is the importance of previous year questions. They not only help you to have a direction, but also they will help you sometimes directly to solve questions in your exam. Fine. So first statement is correct statement because we know that coal ash or fly ash consists of certain toxic elements like arsenic, mercury, lead, chromium. Fine. Second statement, coal fired power plants release sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen into the environment. We know that the prime source of sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen is use of fossil fuels and coal is one of the fossil fuel and if coal is used in the production of power in thermal power plants, it obviously will release oxides of sulfur and nitrogen and that's why second statement is also correct statement. Third statement, high ash content is observed in Indian coal. So one of the problems with Indian coal is that it consists of more concentration or more content of ash and hence it produces more fly ash and that is one of the lacunas with respect to the quality of coal in India, right? And that's why all these three statements are correct and hence answer is D. 1, 2 and 3. Next now.
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन अकॉर्डिंग टू इंडिया नेशनल पॉलिसी ऑन बायोफ्यूल गिवन इन ट्वेंटी एटीन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग कैन बी यूज एज रॉ मटेरियल फॉर प्रोडक्शन ऑफ बायोफ्यूल्स इन इंडिया अगेन we have discussed one question related to biofuel and this question is again related to biofuel but here what the, what they have done they have used or they have given you the raw material which can be or which is allowed by the government through national biofuel policy 2018 to be used as a raw material for production of biofuels so op- statements are first cassava damaged wheat grains groundnut seeds horse gram rotten potatoes or rotten potatoes sugar beet etc fine so you have to identify out of these six products which can be used for the production of biofuels so as per the policy given in 2018 cassava damaged grains it may be of wheat next rotten potatoes and sugar beet can be used for the production of biofuels and hence answer is 1 2 5 6 mentioned in a mentioned in option a and that's why answer is a so you can read this the policy categorizes biofuel as basic fuel so this policy national biofuel policy 2018 it categorizes biofuels in certain categories first is basic biofuels that means first generation of bioethanol and biodiesel are basic biofuels second advanced biofuels that means second generation of biofuels which consist of ethanol municipal solid waste to drop in fuels etc and third generation of biofuels consist of bio cng etc to enable extension of appropriate financial and fiscal incentives under each categories so these categories are made to make sure that the financial incentives are provided by the government to such categories or the biofuels produced from such categories and the government has allowed the use of sugar cane juice sugar containing materials like sugar beet sweet sorghum starch containing materials like corn cassava this is mentioned in question sugar beet is mentioned in question damaged food grains like wheat broken rice rotten potatoes unfit for human consumption for ethanol production which is a biofuel and that's why answer is a 1 2 and 5 6 right so uh, that was about the discussion of of questions related to pollution in next session we will resume our discussion of few other previous year questions and in this session i hope you have understood the importance of previous year questions generally previous year question and syllabus are considered as a lighthouse that means they will direct our study but here we have also seen that previous year questions also inspire questions for that particular year prelims i hope it is clear to you thank you for your time i am rajwardhan bodekar signing off until we meet next time stay tuned thank you